Today I've entitled my message as Revealed with Fire. Wow. What is supposed to be revealed with fire? Let me go straight into the scripture words taken from 1 Corinthians 3.13. Each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And this is simply talking to believers church. It's believers that is talking to and we got to be very careful because why it's to God's children that God wants to tell us that through this scripture that after being born again how are we living our life and how are we going to use our body for the glory of God and the word is found there in this scripture the word manifest in different translation I went into all the translation to see they all use different words, but they all mean the same thing. Manifest is to show forth what it is. It's an evident, or maybe it's revealing or unveiling something that is in us, shown outwardly. And this word states to what Paul has been using. You know, he's trying to use a metaphor of constructing a building to present the growth of the elects in Corinth. You know, if you look at the preceding scriptures or verses, you'll find that Paul is talking about a building, metaphorically. And Paul pictures himself as a master builder who laid the foundation of Jesus Christ. Paul did this when he first preached the gospel of God's righteousness to them. So important, church, that before he came to this scripture verse to talk and to warn the believers, He's talking about it as a, like a building where he claimed to be the master builder and he built by preaching the gospel of God's righteousness to the Corinthian church. And he's warning that now that you're born again, he's telling the leaders to everybody that how do you build on that? Very important. The building, which is the foundation, is Jesus Christ. And of course, Paul has done it so beautifully and skillfully by declaring the gospel of God's righteousness by how Jesus through his baptism has taken the sin and how he died and how he rose again and through the three witnesses that we always talk about the spirit, water and the blood he has built the foundation who is Jesus and now he's warning them I've done my job and how do you build from then on so he's warning the Corinthian that the way that we build as believers as true born again children of God matters because why our reward really hangs on this the way that we would serve God now it's so important that Paul also is talking about the quality of cheap and expensive building materials you know it's this is actually a reflection that he's using to present to us the quality of our work rendered to God so you'll see that in the scripture, if you were to read the preceding, it talks about the materials that used. And it says that during the, doing the work of God, according to Paul, is like, you know, following God's standard, building with good stuff. So once we are born again, the foundation is laid, Jesus Christ, and how we build on it, whether we build on ourselves or on other people that's around us. How do you build on top of it, on that building? The materials that we use, like gemstones he uses, which are precious stones and precious metals. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about the other cheaper materials. And uh, he's trying to help us to understand Sometimes when we use gem stones or hard materials or precious material, it's harder to acquire, it's harder to build. But when, because they are durable, they're lasting, they're durable. And, and then, but the work that is done with uh, low quality materials, you know, they can be distorted, watered down, and uh, it may not be strong. It can be so easily be blown away or crumble. You can see in buildings, the type of material they use matters. Some materials are very good and they stay there very long. 
You see, in some parts of the world, you know, I have an experience of going to India. They build their homes. We're just using clay, sometimes uh, uh, leaves. You know, they use very low material which they can afford. But they're open to a lot of problems because when wind or rain, it can just crumble and fall off. But when you build with solid materials, heavy metals or stone, precious, expensive, then the lasting effect is longer, natural. And Paul is using this as a figure of speech. He's trying to help us to understand how do you build? You know, are we building on what's already been laid in our lives today as born-again children of God? We have the foundation so beautifully being built. And what we're going to build on it? Or how are we going to build on somebody's life we have not known the Lord. When we take this gospel, are we doing it like how Paul did? Building it with a solid foundation for that individual to grow so that they may enjoy. Today the message is so distorted, so watered down, done half-heartedly. This simply speaks about low quality materials. There's no lasting effect. The believer's life are not permanent. Anything happens in their life, they just simply walk away. We've seen it. Because it was not firm foundation. Yes, they speak about Jesus, but the foundation was built the way that Paul would expect us. And it's easy to build such kind of a building. Very short period, but it's got no long-term benefits. Now, Paul shows that the quality of the materials matters because he's saying that a fire is coming that will reveal all. And he says that this fire will come on the day. Now Paul is looking forward to what he called the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is found in 1 Corinthians 1.8. He says here, Who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the day of our Lord. So when the Lord comes back, you want a solid foundation. People who have the righteousness of faith in their heart. And people who are born again correctly in the Spirit. On that day, this matters. What have we built off? What kind of material did we used? When we serve God, what kind of a material do we use? Are they quality materials or cheap materials? So, it's very important. And this is the day of Christ's judgment that will come up upon during the end time. You know, Paul pictures this specific judgment you know, of God, intended for elects and not for unbelievers. So, whatever he's talking here, he's talking to the Corinthian believers. People are born again. This is not for unbelievers. This judgment that he's talking about is for us. How, after being born again, we use our body? Are we using it to build on somebody's life, quality lives on somebody else? Or how do we serve God? And all that happens from then on. How do we use our body? And that will be judged. Our salvation is not at stake, but the quality of our work will be rewarded. If it's a low quality, then you lose out. But it's a good quality because you're going to be put to test. That's how, and we are given spiritual gifts, church, and we've got to put it to use so that we can serve God. Let me show you a scripture in 1 Corinthians 1, 5 to 7. It says here that you were enriched in everything by Him, by God, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's simply saying that we, when we're born again with the Spirit of God, we, it came with so many beautiful gifts of God, the spiritual gifts, intended that after being born again, we will put it to use. So then it will manifest, it become evident, become visible. It can be shown forth the quality work that we do. But still, the attitude is important. How are we going to do it? Are we going to use it to build solid foundation in the hearts of people that we minister to? In all that we do, it matters. Because at the day of judgment, it's going to be revealed. It will not be a judgment of the people of themselves. Paul has written it clearly that by God's grace, of course, we are saved by the grace of God, by faith in the gospel of God's righteousness. Our salvation is safe. But the work that we do, 
And I told you before that, you know, when we were in the flesh, we did many things. Of course, some of it was good. Of course, we did evil as well. But it does not matter to God because it was done through the flesh. But now that we are born again, when you are doing it in the spirit, the quality of your work matters to God. Today we are talking about manifestation. What kind of work are we doing? Is it something that worth being rewarded? You got to look into it. Is it worth being re re rewarded? Because why on that day it will be tested with fire. So my topic today, reveal with fire. And I pray that you're going to understand exactly what is expected. And Paul is warning. And this sometimes the judgment seed is called the bima seed. The bima seed of judgment. Applied to those who are born again of the water and spirit. And only for the sake of determining the eternal rewards for us. This speaks of judgment of the works done by those of us who serve the Lord after being saved in the church, in the world. We serve God. It's not about salvation. Salvation, we are saved. No question about it. But after that, God wants to reward us. So there's such thing as the judgment seat of Christ, which is the bima, and also the white throne judgment. That's for whether you're a believer or non-believer. Judgment of eternal Salvation or eternal damnation. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We've spoken so much in the New Testament where Christ will judge us based on the work that we have done with our body after being served. Because I told you, our body is an instrument before it is used for evil, but it's been crucified together with Christ. Today, our body can be used by the Spirit of God within us. And God gave us the gifts of the Spirit so that we can utilize them and do quality work. And we can be rewarded. So this is a, a kind of encouragement to all of us at NCCKL. How are we going to conduct ourselves? You know, cheap, casual material that Paul mentioned before would be destroyed in the fire. Well, metals and gems would survive church. So the work we do. Now I'm going to take it down to another scripture. And I'm going to use this scripture to be the basis of my message today. In 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I think it's a very clear, explicitly spoken word of God. I think all of us understand whether good or bad. So it simply says that after being born again, we can do many bad things with the body, walking in the flesh, walking without faith. But we are called to walk by faith in the spirit to produce good works. Let me once again reiterate because why I don't want you to be confused. While eternal life is a free gift given on the basis of God's grace, each of us will still be judged by Christ. This judgment will reward us for how we lived our life out in Christ. You know, God's gracious gift of salvation does not free us from the requirement for faithful obedience. The reason why I always emphasize to you, our faithful obedience is very vital after being born again. And this church, we emphasize it and we guide you, we lead you. We have a theme for the year, we've got monthly focus. All these are intended with a vision and we carry it out with a mission to fulfill that we all will become prophets, become priests and kings for Jesus Christ on this earth. So these are how we can produce quality work that can truly be tested by fire and still become durable and become a lasting work. So we will have to give an account in how we lived our life. In Matthew 16 verse 27, it says here, For the, man, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to his work. Wow, Jesus Christ is coming back in the glory of his Father, with his angel. We simply, with this reason, to reward us, the born again. How, after being born again, we have used our body, whether for our good or for bad. For good, then you're in for a great reward from our Lord and Jesus Christ. You know, I wanted to know, church, that he lacks, you know, as you look at this scripture that I always quote, you know, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Taken from 2 Corinthians 5.17. 
I just want you to know that He likes a brand new people on the inside. The Holy Spirit gives us a new life and we are not the same anymore. We are not reformed church. We are not rehabilitated. We are not re-educated. We are recreated. Religion will reform you, rehabilitate you, re-educate you. All done in the flesh. No, we don't do that. We have died to the flesh. We are alive in the spirit. We are recreated in Christ Jesus. So living in virtual union with Christ is very important. At conversion, we are not merely turning over a new leaf. We are beginning a new life under a new master. As elects, we will be called to account. And we have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has been doing in the body, whether good or bad. We will be held responsible, church, for our actions, purposes, goals, motives, and the use of our, whether it's a good use or the misuse of three most important aspects of our life. And I'm going to focus on these three. How you use or whether you misuse these three important aspects of our life. And I can, uh, of course, there are many more, but I just want to focus on these three things. Number one, or point number one, time. I told you earlier, whether we, you know, we can use our body for good or for bad. So these three aspects matters a lot. The good year, how you are going to use the time that has been given to us by God. You know, our time for changing may be running out. I always tell you that we are living in the last days. You can see what's happening around us. You know, the COVID-19, the pandemic, and these are all there in the scriptures. These are all birth pangs. These are all the beginning of what's going to happen in the end days. We see it. It's being manifested right before us. And we will not lose sight. So time is running out. And God is showing us great patience. He's shown us in the past, even now. He's waiting for us to live the way that He showed us in the Word. Some of us, maybe we are not. So you can't produce quality work from your body. We can't see, you know, I want you to know that we can't see the stopwatch of God's patience. Because you will come like a thief. And this is no bargaining for additional time. So time is very essential. Let me show you a scripture in Exodus 16 verse 23. It says here, Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil. Wow, what a scripture. And lay up for yourself all that remains to be kept until morning. Now this simply God is saying that guard your time with God. The Israelites were not to work on the Sabbath, not even to cook food. Why? God knew that, that the busy routine of life, daily living, the, we call it the treadmill of life, could distract people from worshipping Him. Even then, in the time of Moses, the people were very busy doing many things. What more today? He knew that. That's why He made the Sabbath. Nobody does anything, not even cooking. And it's so easy to let work today, family, responsibility, and recreation to crowd our schedules so tightly that we don't take time to worship our God. You know, carefully guarding our time with God is very, very important. You know, today, of course, we don't celebrate the Sabbath. We have the Lord's Day, the New Testament, the Holy Sacred Day. And sometimes the same principle needs to be applied how Sabbath was looked at as the uncompromising where Israelites cannot do anything. Today, God wants us to rest on this day. You know, during the Sabbath, there are two purposes. It was time to rest and a time to remember what God had done. And church, if we don't rest on Sunday, we can see in the world, some people, they work every other day. There's no rest at all. And they think that they are producing more, they are more efficient, the quality is better. No. It's been proven even by the world that they don't. They need a rest. Man needs a rest. Everything must put a stop, at least a day, the first day of the week. And then we start the week. And this was intended in the Old Testament with the Sabbath. For the purpose of worshipping God who created us, because we were made to worship God. And for us who are born again in this church, 
We take time. That's why I'm very, very particular, your attendance, whether physically or whether now online, that you'll be there. On this day, you're supposed to rest. Rest in Christ, to sit there and honor God and worship Him and remember what God has done in our lives. We need that rest, church. Without time out from the hustle and bustle of life, we lose the meaning of life. Now, God is reminding us that without the Lord's Day, that we celebrate through online services, we'll forget the purpose for all our activity and lose the balance crucial to a faithful life in Christ. Make sure that your Lord's Day you know, provides you a time of both refreshment, rest, and remembrance of God. <coughs> As a family, we enjoy it. Anna cooks good food. We sit down there and enjoy the Lord and celebrate His goodness on a Sunday morning. Moving to a lunchtime. We have lunch together as a family. <coughs> we sit down, we enjoy, we take a good nap and rest. And then we wait for the Tamil church. Another, you know, a moment of enjoying and celebrating the goodness and the greatness of God. So the day is so beautiful. I'm enjoying it, but that doesn't mean that you don't come back to church. Huh? You must come back to church. But I'm just telling you that, you know, it really, really helps us to go back to that days of the Israelites where they literally stayed at home. They can't even go out. Three quarters of a mile. It's already working. So they stay at home. They can't even go out and pick manna. They've got to stay in their camps. God wants them to just simply rest and remember the goodness and the grace of God and worship Him. It's exactly what we are doing now. So to us, it's a plus point. Church, manifestation, church. Good or bad work from our body. Let me give you another scripture, church. Psalms 39, verse 5 to 6. Indeed, you have made my days as end breaths. And my age is nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. Church, we ought to be spending more time of thinking about eternity. The brevity of life is a theme throughout the books of Psalms. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. It's ironic that people spend so much of time securing their lives on earth and spend very little time or no thought about where they will spend eternity. David realized that amassing riches and busily accomplishing tasks would make no difference in eternity. Few people understand that their only hope is in the Lord. You know, this narrow gate, only a few find the way to life. Many go to the broad gate, a way of destruction. So don't be so caught up in too much. I'm not saying that don't go out and work, don't earn and don't become rich. No, nothing is wrong in that. But please don't become oblivious that we spend more time in heaven than on this earth. And we don't take anything out from here. In Luke 12, 20, this is what God said. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? You know, understanding God's perspective of time is very, very crucial in these last days. Now, the rich man in Jesus' story died before he could even begin to use what was stored in his big barns. You know, planning for retirement, preparing for life before death is a wise thing, church. But neglecting life after death is a disastrous thing. If we accumulate wealth, only to enrich ourselves with no concern for God and His church, we will enter eternity empty-ended. Nothing. Nothing to carry. Empty we came, empty we go. The only thing you can carry with you is the work that you have done in faith in the Spirit of Christ. This will be rewarded. And why do we save money, church, sometimes? And why, why we do retire? Why do we buy expensive cars and houses? Why do we want to be more secure every other time? Because we want security, we want to have a good life on this side of the world. Is there anything wrong about it? No. But Jesus is challenging us to think beyond earthbound goals and to use what we have been given for God's kingdom. Faith, service and obedience to God are the way to become rich towards God. I'm talking to you, time is important. And how are you going to use that time? For the furtherance of God's kingdom on earth. Very important. How we use time matters, church. 
How is your body? Good or bad? Because you're going to be rewarded accordingly. Now, point number two, church, opportunities. Opportunities, another aspect of life, because all of us in this side of the world will be given opportunities in Christ. How do you see this opportunity? Now, in Exodus 2, verse 7 to 8, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman that she may nurse the child for you? This is a Miriam, okay? This is a Moses' sister, the oldest sister. And we all know that Moses was put in a basket and they all had a funeral service on that day because the child should be killed. But they took a different path by, by just laying it into the river Nile and then he was floating and going and the sister kept going you know, wanting to see where is this basket aiding. And eventually she noticed that the Pharaoh's daughter was observing it as well. And she, she called the handmaids to go and pick it up, the basket. And this girl went quickly, interjected and intervened that situation. And she proposed, that's a daring move. She proposed to the Pharaoh's daughter, you know, that she can offer a service someone to nurse this baby. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Whose mother was this? Moses' mother. So Miriam used that opportunity and the family was reunited again. And we all know the story that Moses was raised in the palace by her own mother. What a story this is. Because why this little girl, little sister of Moses took the opportunity Church, don't let fear keep you from opportunities, church, to serve God. Stay ready for opportunities in life. They may come when we least expect them. Miriam, the baby sister, saw that Pharaoh's daughter had discovered Moses. Quickly, she took the initiative to suggest a mother who could care for the baby. Their family was reunited, as I mentioned earlier. Special opportunities may come our way unexpectedly in Christ. In the church life, whether it's the world or within the church, God will give us opportunity. Don't let fear of what might happen cause you to miss an opportunity. Miriam did not. Be alert for the opportunities of God. Because God will give it to us. We've got to take full advantage of them like Miriam. Don't sidestep it. Don't shoo it away. Don't put it aside. Seize it. It's actually intended to reward you so that you can use your body for the purposes of God. Now in Numbers church, 14 verse 20 to 23, then the Lord said, I've pardoned according to your word, but truly, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of God. Verse 22, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to test, now this 10 times, and I have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to the fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Now church, increased opportunity brings increased responsibility. The people of Israel had a clearer view of God than any people before them, for they had both his word and his physical presence. You can see that when God led them from Egypt to the promised land, then everything they had a personal relationship with God. God spoke to Moses, their leader, gave them every instruction. The word of the law of God was there for them. God guided them. God gave them the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud to lead them. And he fed them, he clothed them, he did everything. They saw him move mightily. But their refusal to follow God and to bear witness of his miraculous deed made the judgment against them more severe. And I mentioned to you, as Jesus said, for everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. You know, church, in Luke 12, 48, they were given a lot, but they did not use it to bear witness and to glorify God and to declare His praises to the world. We too today, church, how much is our, our responsibility to obey and serve God? We have been chosen and given the gospel of God's righteousness. Our church is simply a blessed church. And I always keep saying this proudly, that in the whole of Malaysia, I don't know how many churches are truly preaching this beautiful gospel. We are. 
We're a small group of people here who truly believe. And we know it's true because we are born again. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We see it manifest right before us in the lives of our brothers and sisters. People have come to this church who are born again. We can see them change. I see it day in, day out. And that's a miraculous manifestation of God's power working in our lives. We know that it's the only gospel that has the power to save one's soul. So church, there's a massive responsibility, church. A lot has been given to us and God will hold us accountable. Just like how Israel was given so much, but they failed him miserably. We should not, church. We should serve him and declare this gospel to the world. In a 1 Samuel church, in uh, verses, uh, chapter 23, verse 7, and Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul, so Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. For he shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And this is a story where Saul was really wanting to kill David. And, and news came to him that, that, Saul, that David is actually in a, in, a, in, a, in a town, fully gated with bars. And he thought that this is the greatest opportunity, you know, and that he can go in there and destroy them and destroy David. He thought that God was actually opening a door for him to fulfill his desire of wanting to, to kill David. Sometimes opportunities would come to us, but not, not every opportunity is sent from God. When Saul heard that David was trapped in a gated area, Saul thought God was putting David at his mercy. Saul wanted to kill David so badly. He seized the opportunity. Had Saul known God's character, he would not have misread the situation as God's approval for murder church. Because God says, thou shalt not murder. Not every opportunity is sent from God's church. An opportunity to do something against God's will can never be from God because God does not tempt us. When opportunities come our way, double check our motives. Make sure we are not following our own desires, but God's desires. So, I also want to caution you. As much as I want you to seize the opportunity, but there are opportunities that come along your way. A career, promotion, you know, a new life elsewhere. Many things will happen to you. Sometimes we can become so blinded. It's our own desire that we want to cherish. Is it God's desire? Is it God is opening the opportunity for you? In a relationship, somebody comes in your life. Is it God? Or you want to seize the opportunity? You got to really wait. But actually, as I mentioned earlier, opportunities are given to us in Christ to serve so that we can use our body in a manner that is good, that glorifies God. Amen, church? In Ezra 8.15, church, another portion of scripture. Now, I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava. And we came there three days. And I looked among the people and the priests and found none of the sons of Levi there. What does it talk about? And you go back and tell, I'm giving you only some verses here, but you go back and read the context of the story. This basically Ezra who came to Jerusalem to rebuild with Nehemiah. He looks around, his work is altered or stopped or ended because the Levite did not join in. They couldn't find the priests. You know, look for opportunities to volunteer church. Ezra's progress was in that while he wanted to recruit Levites. There are not much Levites there. God has called this man to special service. And yet a few were willing to volunteer when the service were needed. He gathered all of them. He saw the Levites, the priests are all missing. Nobody volunteered among this tribe. The church. God has gifted each one of us at NCCL with abilities. So we can make contribution to his kingdom. We don't wait to be recruited, but look for opportunities to volunteer and don't hinder God's work by holding back. Hallelujah. It's wonderful church. It's so beautiful that God's word are recorded for us for these purposes. And uh, let me just move on church. In Luke 23 verse 35 church, and the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. It's Jesus. 
He died at the cross. The Galilean women stayed put. The disciples fled. And they used the opportunity God has given them to follow. You know, they followed Joseph to the tomb so that they know where exactly the body of Jesus was. And then this woman, they went back and they brought spices and perfume so that they can embalm and clean up the body of Jesus. You know, this is very important at this moment. This woman could not, women could not do great things for Jesus. But they did what they could. They seized the opportunity. They stayed at the cross when most of the disciples had fled. And they fulfilled the most important part by giving Jesus a good, clean, cleaned him up, his body, all blood all over, and bowed him with spices and perfume so that he can be laid to rest. You know, church, as elects, we may feel we can't do much for Jesus. We are called to take advantage of the opportunities given us, doing what we can and not worrying about what we cannot do. Some of us here, these women, from the Galilee, they took the advantage. They couldn't do many things like the men. They can't go and talk about God and, and, and go against the council or the rulers. And, and they didn't have that sort of a call. They did not do that, but they did what they can do. As women, they gathered and they took the body and gave them a beautiful pre-burial or the work that was done only by them. So some of us in our church here, don't worry what you can't do. Think about what you can do. I'm sure God will use you as well. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, it says here, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Sometimes, church, according to the scripture, we've got to see our troubles as opportunities. Our troubles should not diminish our faith. We should release that there is, we should realize that there is a purpose in our suffering. Problems and human limitations, church, provide several opportunities. It reminds us of Christ's suffering for us. It keeps us uh, from pride, causes us to look beyond this brief life, prove our faith to others, give God the opportunity to demonstrate His power through our lives. And all these things can happen. Sometimes trouble comes to us. All of us will face. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. How do you confront it? You see, there's an opportunity that through these moments, your faith should be always in Christ. And God can turn it around for you. And you'll become very strong in your faith in God's righteousness, which is a power to always save you and keep you safe. Amen, church? We're going to move on to the third point, church. Another aspect is so important that we have to manifest it. Because on that day, Time, opportunities, and the third point, abilities will decide whether are we are going to be rewarded or we are not going to be rewarded. In our salvation is intact, we are going to heaven, but we want to go heaven full with a lot of things full, of, full in our hands, not empty-ended. So time is important. How you use your time? So that your body will use time properly and correctly and appropriately. How you use opportunities? Your body has to use it. Seize the opportunities. And thirdly, abilities that come from your body. In Exodus 38, verse 21, this is the inventory of the tabernacle church. The tabernacle of the testimony, which was counted according to the commandment of Moses for the service of the Levites by the end of Itama. Itama, son of Aaron the priest. You know, what I gathered from this scripture was, and I took this scripture verse and I keep reading, I found, I found some truth about liability here. You see, Moses did not build the tabernacle. You know, each has different abilities to fulfill here. All their calls in building the tabernacle. Moses laid out the steps how to build. But Itama supervised the project. You know, we all have different abilities in our church. Just like how God did not ask Moses to build the tabernacle, but to motivate the experts to do it. You know, as a shepherd, sometimes it's not for me you know, to do many things. And I realize it very quickly. That's why I know some of you are experts in your field, in whatever you are doing. I see in the beam ministry, this happening. I just can't do anything what they are doing. They all are experts. But I'm there. My job is to motivate, supervise, 
guide, lead, give them direction, show them what they can do because they are the experts. And I respect the expertise. I don't simply go and intervene and try to change. I know that's not my cup of tea. But I will advise them so that all that they do will become fruitful and that we all can enjoy God to our online services. This is one thing there. In every aspect of the church life, sometimes a shepherd is only called to plan, vision, mission, how to carry out, how to execute. And I need all of you in our church. We all have different abilities. God, you know, just like how did not ask Moses to build, just to motivate. We too got to look for areas where God has gifted us with abilities and then seek opportunities to allow God to use our abilities to the fullest. And I can see in our church, some of you are so resourceful, so good at certain work that you do. And I got to you, and you got to volunteer yourself. You got to come forward and give so that we can use you, so that you can be rewarded handsomely and you can feel worth because God has used you mightily. Now in Exodus 28, verse 3, church, so you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments, to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. So they are making Aaron's garments. You know, this is simply to tell you, don't let your abilities diminish. The tailors here were called, who made Aaron's garments, were given wisdom by God. God's wisdom. For what? In order to do the task. To, have to make more garments for Aaron to wear on his priestly duties, during his priestly duties. And they were given wisdom to do that. You know, all of us have special skills, as I mentioned earlier. You know, God wants us to, God wants to fill us with his spirit so that he may use them for his glory. So I want you to really take time to think. Some of you during this time when you are in the home, not coming to church, you have a lot of time to ponder and sit and think. Yeah, you do your work and do this and that, but you got more time, no more traveling up and down. So you got more time to really think and ponder. Because why there are special abilities that God has given to you. And the way God can use you for the furtherance of his kingdom on earth, which is the church of God. You know, if you don't put it to use, you don't eke out that talent and recognize the fact that God has placed it there and he don't put it to use for his glory, I tell you, talents will, 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 will eventually will diminish. Slowly fade away. Yes, I always tell you that our human body, when you don't put your hand to use for a long time, three, four months, then it becomes very weak. If you people who are actually on the wheelchairs, you can see their leg, you just go and look at it. It all becomes so thin and pale because they're not put to use because they can't walk. Over time, they, you know, it just shrinks because there's not much of a blood flow. Because they don't walk, they don't run, they don't do things with their legs. Similarly, in the spiritual element as well, when God has placed our ability in you and not putting it to use, over time it will diminish or it becomes it fade away. And don't let that allow don't let that don't allow that to happen to you. You must be rewarded, church. God has placed it there so that He can reward you. In Luke 12, 48, church, it says here, but he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. I told you earlier, responsibly to use them well. Jesus has told us how to live until he comes back. We must watch for him, work diligently, obey his commandments, such attitudes are especially necessary for leaders in this church. I thank God for good leaders. God is raising so many good leaders in this church. And they know that they are called as leaders. And there's an every responsibility on them. They must be faithful because they're called to lead. There's some followers here as well. But the leaders, you got to be watchful and faithful leaders. Because on that day, you have to give an account. Because you are given increased opportunities, abilities and time and responsibilities so that you'll carry it out effectively. And the more resources and ability and understanding that been given to us as a believer of Christ, 
the elect, the more we are responsible to use them effectively. God will not hold us responsible for abilities. He has not given us, but of all of us, but all of us have enough abilities to keep us busy until Jesus comes. Nobody can say, I've got no ability, so I've got nothing to do. I want to just simply sit and rest and wait for the Lord to come back and take me back home. No. We are given enough ability so that we will become so busy serving God in these last days, in all that we are. Hallelujah. Church in 1 Peter church, 10, 11 church. As each one of us has received a gift, minister it to one another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Church, the scripture is simply telling us this. Invest your abilities wisely. Some people are well aware of their abilities. They believe that somehow, I don't know where they get that sort of a faith, that they, can, they have the right to use the ability as they please. They use the ability as they please. They're born again, eh? That's how they perceive. And others feel that they have no abilities to offer. So there's two groups of people. And Peter is addressing both groups in this verse. Everyone has some gifts. You got to find yours and use them. In this case, Peter is talking about uh, serving, ministering, whether it's teaching, administration. And all of us have abilities should be used in serving God and His church. So none are actually our own exclusive enjoyment. When you are born again, you belong to Christ. The church is a place where you now God wants you to invest so that you can use your time, use your opportunities, and use your abilities so that in all that you do, the whole church can be blessed and can, we can move together strong and vibrant for the glory of God. In Ephesians 4, verse 4 to 7, there's one body and one spirit church. Yes, you are called to one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. <laughs> Amen. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Amen. Now, church, what is I trying to say is that this scripture we are a body of Christ. We are a church of God. We all are bound together in the common faith. And uh, what we have to do is that we got to utilize. We got to utilize them in the church. It's exactly what uh, Paul is saying to the Ephesian church. Now, we have been built together as one body because we all have the common faith. In the gospel of God's righteousness. We believe in the baptism, death and resurrection of Jesus. And this common faith has brought us together spiritually as one body. And all elects belong, at NCCKL belong to one body. We are united under one head, Christ himself. Each elect has, has been given abilities so that we all can strengthen the whole body. You know, very simple. In Corinthians, he says that your eyes, your ears, your nose, all of them are part of this body. And they all need to function so that this body can be healthy and carry forth the intended purposes. Isn't it so, church? So, similarly, the body of Christ is, is a body that we all have a part to play. And all of us are given different abilities that we can all render it for the wholeness of the body of Christ. You know, church, sometimes our abilities may seem small or large, but it's ours to use in God's service. You know, ask God to use you in a unique way because you have certain unique abilities to contribute to the strength and the health of the body of Christ. And church, I've spoken to you three important aspects, time, opportunities, and abilities. And this one, I expect church, a born-again ch church of God, we have the manifold blessings that are already manifested, blessings that we have received in Christ. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is the one that's going to move us and drive us and cause us to do so that we can all use our body as an instrument of righteousness, that we can use our body to do good works 
so that we can be rewarded handsomely on that day of the Lord when He comes with His rewards. You know, you know, we, you know, the world talks about Santa Claus bringing rewards. They are all excited to wait for Santa Claus to come. These are all fairy tales. But this God has given us a word. He's coming back with rewards so that we can anticipate that. And He will never tell lies so that we can all receive rewards. Once again, let me reiterate. It's not about your salvation. You are going to heaven as you keep this faith. But while you are keeping this faith, your body should be used for the furtherance of God's glory on earth. Amen, church. So church, I brought an end to today's message. I pray that you've been blessed. You understood what manifestation is all about. Today, reveal with fire. Whatever that we do will be tested with fire on that day in the seat of judgment seat of Christ. And we want to be stones, gems, quality metals, and not some kind of a cheap material that we build our church, our lives, and our people around us. Amen, church?